It's because of that fact that we're going to see all the, the spiritual and prophetic implications. I mean, we've all heard that what? Mathematics is the universal language, right? I'm beginning to wonder if nanotechnology is the universal technology. I mean, you'd have to conclude that after some of the things. I mean, just, just a casual uh, amount of time spent researching this, uh, it, it just blows the mind. And I don't say that as if to suggest that I'm a proponent of this type of sci tech uh, or as to act, of his, uh, act as if this has seduced me to believe in it more than God, like so many of its proponents sadly do. No, not at all, of course not. But I say that to simply point out how the more I study it, the more I'm beginning to see the serious spiritual threat. All right, so I, 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 I know I've said that a number of times this morning. There's a reason for it. I really want that to sink in here because I, I truly feel that this is so very important for us to, to really grasp and, and uh, take in. As Christians, one of the fundamental tenets of our shared faith is our belief in the account of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, nanotechnology has the ability to alter God's creation, not just at the atomic level, the molecular level, but there's scientific proof that's been published as recently as last month to indicate that it can even alter one's DNA. So when you, when you think about it in terms of that, altering God's creation, what are we doing? What are we, why are we playing around with this? Is this really the kind of science and technology that we should be encouraging our best and brightest minds to focus their time and attention, their, their God-given gifts, upon trying to understand and advance? Of course not. Another reason why I feel that nanotechnology is a prime example of a forbidden science because of the way in which these microscopic sentient machines not only have the capacity to think on their own, but if they can think on their own, is it really a stretch to think that they can influence our thinking if they were injected into our bodies? Now, at this point in the presentation, you might think, wow, Jeff's completely lost it. That's crazy. But I'm going to show you, I'm going to share with you the results of a study here in a few minutes a study that was done at a university just 10 minutes from where I live, the University of Buffalo, that proved some pretty alarming things connected to that idea, that very concept. Nanobots, here's the other thing with nanobots. They can even multiply. Uh, the phrase used is that they're self-replicating. So now we have a sentient creation we have a self-replicating creation. And not only that, but I, I mean, well, I'll just say this. I mean, why is it, why would we want to play around with something like that? I mean, that, that's a threat. As Christians, we can see that threat, but that's not just a threat to our, our faith and uh, what we hold so near and dear to our, to our hearts and in our lives, but that's a threat to humanity. So this should concern everyone, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. And despite what we're being told, nanotechnology is not humanity's saving grace. That title is reserved for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for him and for him alone. But what is nanotechnology exactly? Nanotechnology shortened to nanotech. Uh, the true definition is that it's the study of the controlling of matter on an atomic and molecular scale. Generally speaking, nanotechnology deals with structures, get this, sized between 1 to 100 what are called nanometers. And it involves developing materials or devices within that size. Now I know this next part will be a little academic, but uh, you know, just bear with me. I'll, I'll try to explain this as best I can, uh, as best I can here. Uh, a DNA double helix has a diameter around 2 nanometers. On the other hand, the smallest cellular life forms are around 200 nanometers in length. Now, to bring this into some real-world terms that we can, that, that I could, I definitely grasped and I was thankful for when uh, the Lord led me to it, the comparative size of a nanometer to a meter is the same as that of a marble to the size of the planet Earth. To put it in another way, a nanometer is the amount an average man's beard grows in the time it takes him to raise the razor 
from the sink to his face. And then lastly, I even read that a speck of dust would be considered a very large nanobot. So that gives you the idea of, of what we're dealing with here. I mean, they're so small you can't even see them with a traditional microscope. Now, carbon nanotubes, which are considered the poster child of the uh, burgeoning nanotech industry, are often thought to epitomize nanotech so much so, so that the global market for these tiny cylindrical molecules is expected to grow to become a multi-billion dollar industry in just the next two years alone, according to some estimates. And that's a conservative estimate, the one that I came across. The fact is that millions of dollars are already being spent today on researching the various applications for nanotechnology. And researchers tell us that these nanotubes promise to revolutionize electronics, computers, chemistry, and materials science. Basically, they're projected to have an impact on just about everything that exists in our daily lives. Everything. Of course, they give scientists high hopes, given what they believe about how science is what will truly save us from all the ills in the world, from, from death, whatever the case may be. And they believe this because of the remarkable properties, the, the very unique and never before seen properties associated with nanotechnology. Of course, nanotech raises many of the same issues as with any introduction of new technology, including concerns about the toxicity, uh, environmental impact of, of, let's say, nanomaterials, their potential effects on global economics, as well as speculation about various doomsday scenarios, which, of course, that's uh, our focus here today. And rightfully so. But let me try to be a little, real world, uh, a little more real world specific here. This seemingly futuristic technology suggests that humanity will have an edge by using precision instruments called assemblers. Again, these tiny little robots. These assemblers are incredibly small molecular machines able to manipulate matter quickly and cheaply by moving individual atoms. And they're even capable of growing almost any material or structure. Some have asserted that nanotechnology has both good and bad potential. I mean, yeah, yeah you think so? <laughs> I mean, that's quite obvious. Some of the good things that scientists say is in nanotech's future is that it can put an end to world hunger. Using assemblers to synthesize desired food from soil and air, which can put a stop to farming on Earth. Nanotech could replace those farms with indigenous flora and fauna. Another benefit, they tell us, is that it could provide super cures and near immortality. Nan nanomedicine that will seek out diseases and destroy them, leaving everything else within the body intact and cell repair machines that can rejuvenate old or damaged cells. Another benefit, we're told, is that it will provide everyone with a nice place to live. Having your own workforce of nano assemblers, it is theorized, uh, along with a structure and, program and, program and real estate, real estate you, you can have a super strong, strong house or castle, castle in style, style, style that will clean and repair itself. Massive, massive structures to be built to accommodate billions of people. There's also advances in transportation. I mean, what would, it, what, would it, what would you think about being able to buy a cheaper, faster, nicer looking car in any model that you wanted? Or advances in computers and electronics, billions of times more intelligent and faster than the current technology. See, hopefully as Christians, we can recognize how each of these quote-unquote benefits appeals to our emotions and fleshly materialistic desires. Every single one of those benefits that are always trotted out there whenever scientists try to promote or gain funding for this type of science, every single one of them appeals to that. I mean, yeah, it sounds good, but is it really that good? That should be enough of a red flag for us 
But just in case it's not, let me tell you about some of the things that scientists themselves, not Christians, scientists themselves think could be potentially bad when it comes to nanotechnology. And there's only two of them here. The creation of smart diseases. The ability to seek out a particular race and destroy them. The existence of what's called gray goo, which is essentially naughty nanobots that replicate themselves exponentially due to human error, called gray goo, and they could turn the world to dust as it, it roams the planet in what's called a, a nanoswarm, simply looking to devour any organic life that crosses its path. I mean, just stop to think about this for a minute. It sounds like, you know, like uh, an episode of Star Trek. We watched a clip from uh, Star Trek The Next Generation during uh, Derek Gilbert's presentation in the Borg. I mean, it sounds... It, it, how can you not have thoughts of that run through your head when you hear this type of stuff? And yet, this isn't science fiction. This is science fact. It's, it, it's moving from the realm of theor theoretical science. It's becoming full-blown legit science that we can actually work and function with. Again, think back to how I opened this presentation and, and told you about all the ways in which nanotechnology is being used today to make our lives easier, to make our lives better, to make the things that we love in this life better, more appealing. And a quick side note on that last possibility, that last uh, uh, bad possibility of the gray goo. We're all familiar with uh, Prince Charles and his affinity for, for issuing grave warnings. Uh, in March of, of last year, he said that we had, what was it, 100 months to save the world, something along those lines. Then in June of this year, he said that the world needed to follow the Islamic way to save the world. Just a month after that, in July, or a few months ago, he proclaimed, quote, my duty is to save the world. 